talking about ancient civilizations across different continents. So as a practicist, I spend a lot of my time in ancient civilizations around ancient authors and ancient artists. That is, of course, when I have not been spending my time with Sahil organizing this Ghana over the last year. And through this talk, when Hindu Sox was advertising the opportunity to give talks on aspects of Hindu culture, I thought it would be a potent and topical opportunity to discuss the two different cultures and bring them together, both classical culture and Indian classical culture. And that stems from me being one of very few brown classicists in Cambridge and always being asked, why are you studying classics from both sides of my community. So this is me trying to bring them all together. And through the talk, I hope to show that cultural exchange was and still is very important to all of us, and that we can't draw dividing lines between different cultures as easily as easily as we think that we can. They're all involved in dialogue with each other. And they're all sharing aspects of their cultures with each other. And especially in the context of the decolonization debate and everything that we see going on in the news at the moment in terms of the legacy of British imperialism, I think that's very important to bear in mind. And I thought that, that the topic could have added resonance. So first, we're going to do this through art, looking at both its style and its substance. And then we're going to move on to literature, which is the main topic of our talk. But first, I thought we'd do a quick whistle stop historical and geographical tour from Greece to India to contextualize everything that I'm going to talk about. Um, as Rohan said, there is a handout, so please follow along. And Rohan, can I ask that if any questions pop up in chat that are relevant to what I'm directly saying, can you say them out loud so that everyone can hear and then I'll answer them. Okay, perfect. I'm going to share my screen now so that you can see my PowerPoint. Okay, can everyone see that? Perfect. So first, we're going to put into context the relationship between ancient Greece and ancient India. And we're going to examine this through the area of Gandhara, which, as you can see from the map, and the maps are also on the handout, is in what is modern day Afghanistan and Pakistan. And it was part of the ancient Hindu Kush region. So Gandhara was an important Hindu and Buddhist cultural center through which the religion spread to other parts of Asia. So if I just go back to the opening slide, if you look at the image in the top in the top left corner, that is from the Cambodian the C Cambodian temple Angkor Wat, but it's a depiction of the Mahabharata. So that just shows how different cultures diffused through India through this region. Um, it was one of the six Mahajanapads of ancient India, as you can see on the map, and it was mentioned in Buddhist sources, including the fourth Nikaya, and since then it's been known to us through ancient texts. It was also located on the Silk Road, which is very famous for connecting trade routes between the East and the West. So Gandhara has had a long history with ancient civilizations around the Mediterranean. It was conquered by the first Persian empire in the sixth century BC, which at the time was the largest empire the world had ever seen. And you can see that from how much of the world and different continent it's, continents it spans on the map. And through this relationship, India was opened up to Asia Minor and the Mediterranean. And the Indian region was conquered by Cyrus the Great, who, in case anyone was wondering, was the same Persian emperor who conquered parts of Greece. And there, it's kind of the map is blurry, but the circle is over Gandhara, so you can see where it was. So as you can see, very large and widespread empire that facilitated lots of exchange between the different regions. The Persian Empire was also very famous for going up against Greece during the Greco-Persian Wars around this time as well. And then the next key moment in the history of Greece and India comes in 327 BC with the con conquest of India by Alexander the Great. And this is a map of Alexander's empire. And his empire extended as far as the Punjab, as we can see um, from the map and Gandhara is on there as well. Um, oh, there we go, circled. After Alexander's untimely death, the areas that he conquered were divided between his generals, which created the Hellenistic kingdoms. And his death marks the start of the Hellenistic period when we're talking about ancient history. So as you can see from the map, there were lots of different 
kingdoms instead of what was once one empire it's now split into lots of different kingdoms ruled by lots of different people across the mediterranean asia and north africa one group of which was the ptolemies in egypt who you all might best well know through cleopatra who was queen of egypt and she was the last of the ptolemies and that's why everyone says that cleopatra was in fact greek and not egyptian so during this time, Gandhara was conquered and came under the influence of the Bactrians, the Sarkas, and the Parthians. And you can see the Parthian region and the Greco-Bactrian kingdom on the map. And this use of Gandhara as a sphere of influence by different kingdoms continued until 75 BC. So it lasted approximately 250 years. And then came the Kushan Empire. And the Kushan Empire was known as the Golden Period of Gandhara, particularly the rule of Kanishka the Great from 128 to 51 AD. So we've moved from BC to AD or before Christ to after Christ. And during this point, there was lots of contact with Rome and the Roman Empire was fully thriving. But it's important to remember that Gandhara was never under the Roman Empire and neither was India. So we're not talking about provincial culture or cultures being appropriated through imperialism. We're talking about cultural exchange. Gandhara was a border region because Parthia fell under the Roman Empire, so there was clearly a close relationship there. And trade routes extended through Parthia and Gandhara up to the mouth of the Ganges and into Southeast Asia and China until the third century AD. So you can see how this was a very key region for cultural exchange. And now we're going to look at examples of how those cultures blended in ancient art. So here, I'm just gonna drink some water. I've been speaking a lot. Here is a classical sculpture of Venus and probably what you have in mind most when you picture ancient art and especially ancient Greek and Roman art. But now meet her. Okay, so I'm doing some audience participation. So if you want to answer my question, please unmute yourself. Does anyone want to venture a guess as to who they think she is or where she comes from? If any answers are typed for a hand, please just say them out loud. Come on, someone, venture a guess. Um, is it luxury? Because that's what it says on the handout, so. Oh, damn it, almonds. <laughs> You're too attentive. You weren't supposed to notice that. Uh, and I guess right. you know where she's from now as well. Okay, so yes, she is Lakshmi, and she was found in Pompeii, buried by the eruption of Vesuvius, and she dates to around the first century AD, which, if you were paying way more attention to the handout like almonds, you would know by now. Um, so she was found in Italy under the Roman Empire, but she looks so Indian in style, and as Armand just kindly told us, she is in fact Lakshmi. She's not a Greek or Roman goddess. And the style is incredibly Indian, especially the bangles, the necklace, and the clothing. But she also has a similar posture and some of the same proportions as the Venus that we just saw, especially that relaxed leg posture. So how did something like that end up in Naples? in Pompeii when it exploded in the first century, when the volcano exploded in the first century AD. And the answer to that is through cultural exchange and trade routes. This Lakshmi is originally thought to be from Bokhadan in Maharashtra, where similar statuettes have been found. So she is a Lakshmi from Maharashtra, which is also, she reminds me of someone I know very well myself, because my middle name is Lakshmi and my dad is from Maharashtra. So I have a special affinity for this particular statue. But yet she somehow ended up in Pompeii. And clearly she was considered to be of worth and as beautiful and valuable as the classical sculptures that we were just looking at. So she's a very potent example of cultural and commercial exchange between the ancient, the ancient Mediterranean world and ancient India during this time. Similarly, this relief depicts Lakshmi and it's from Sanchi Stoop number two in Madhya Pradesh, which is one of the oldest Buddhist stupas in India. Interestingly, it has the earliest known important display of decorative reliefs in India, including this one of Lakshmi. She dates to around 115 BC, so she's older than the Pompeii Lakshmi by about two centuries, and she's almost contemporaneous to the Venus Medici statue that I showed earlier. 
And you can see how she recalls that classical posture and kind of beauty of proportion that the Venus does kind of go back. So you can see how that is quite similar to this. And she's also attended by two tiny figures that recalls how often in ancient Roman art, Venus is depicted with two cherubs or cupids. We think that this relief was carved by craftsmen from Gandhara, so you can also see how that region is again playing a key role in the transferal of these artistic styles from Greece to India. Now, I'm going to segue very briefly into Greco-Buddhist art because that's what Gandhara is most famous for. And I personally couldn't talk about Gandhara without mentioning the Bamayan Buddhas. The Bamayan Valley, where these Buddhas used to be, falls within the region of Gandhara, and the Buddhas were two colossal sculptures carved into the cliffside, and they were both an important religious and heritage site. And these Buddhas came to represent the blended style of Gandharan art. And what we mean by that is that through the region of Gandhara, Buddhist art took on this kind of form where the Buddha was depicted anthropomorphically and clothed in drapery, as we can see here, the two Buddhas look like they're wearing Greek or Roman togas. And so this is all believed to have been a heavy influence from Greek art into Buddhist art. And that is a problematic theory. We can pick it apart and talk about kind of white supremacist ideas at play there, but it is also true that there was a cultural exchange of types. So these are two very important cultural statues and they were incredibly significant from when they were built in the 6th century CE and until now. But they are also victims of a great tragedy and they represent the threats to world heritage that we see today in our world. These two Buddhas were destroyed by the Taliban in 2001, being blown up bit by bit. And now they look like this. It's just a hollow cliff size where two colossal statues used to stand. And if you go on YouTube, there are so many videos of them being blown up little by little, and you can see bits of them disappearing, and it's very upsetting. But I included them, one, to draw attention to the Greco-Buddhist tradition in this region, but mostly because they're a cautionary example of what can happen when we don't appreciate cultural exchange, and that wild culture and culture from different regions belongs to all of us, whether it's part of our religion and our practice or not. We have one common world heritage and we should be out there protecting it. And by recognizing cultural exchange between different civilizations, we can help to do that. If you would like to ask me more about how I feel on the destruction of sites or statues now, or if you want to ask me more about Greco Buddhist art, please do and we can talk about it later. But for now, we're going to move on to our main topic. And that is epic exchange or the exchange of epic. So next question, we're doing audience participation again, and someone please answer. And this isn't on the handout, I don't think. So you can't cheat on this question. What is epic? Does anyone want to answer? I know there are fellow classicists on here. So one of you at least pop up. Um, it's a it's an extended poem that's written in exams and it's usually about a hero. Um, yeah. That is a good definition. I like the added hexameter bit as well. Um, the definition that I'm going with for the purposes of this is an epic poem is a lengthy narrative poem ordinarily involving a time beyond living memory in which occurred the extraordinary doings of the extraordinary men and women who, in dealings with the gods or other superhuman forces, gave shape to the moral universe for their descendants, the poet and his audience to understand themselves as a people or nation. So. In the Western tradition, the oldest epic poems we have are the poems of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, the penguin versions of which are pictured here. Through the classics, we also look at these in relation to some Eastern European orally composed epics that are newer. So the Homeric epics are the oldest literature in the Western European tradition. You might often hear people saying that they're the oldest literature in the world, and that's just factually untrue and perpetuates another very European Eurocentric imperialist view. So if you hear that, correct people. But they are the oldest in the Western tradition. And we often compare them to some Eastern European epics that were also composed orally because the way that they developed and the 
repetition of words and meter that they use are very similar. And there's an academic called Gregory Nagy, who some of you might have heard of, who does exactly this. He's written a whole book on it. But in fact, the oldest epic in the world is the Gilgamesh epic from Mesopotamia, which, as you can see from the map, is modern day Iraq, Kuwait, Syria and Turkey, so from the Middle East. And it dates to 1800 BC. It may be the oldest literature in the world, and it predates Homer by more than a thousand years. So in the field of classics, as classicists, we're allowed to acknowledge Mesopotamia. It kind of falls within the region beyond our region. So we do talk about Gilgamesh and we refer to Gilgamesh as an epic in relation to Homer. But we never compare Homer to anything further east. For us, the world stops after Mesopotamia. There is clearly nothing of value that happens after that. But that is going to end here and now. It is said that Homer's poetry is sung even in India, where they have translated it into their own speech and tongue. These words were written by Dio, who was a Greek historian writing in Roman times in the first century. And what people have often taken from this is that the Sanskrit epics are translations of Homer with some bits adapted and added in and completely derivative from the Greek tradition. And that sets the tone for the interpretation of these epics over time, especially during British rule in India. There was a lot of interest in them because obviously the Brits were in India, they were in close contact with this material, but they still tended to follow this line that they were completely derivative and inspired by the Homeric epics, instead of as poems original in their own right. But Indian scholars would tell you that this quote is an indication of the existence of the Mahabharat at this time in circulation. So, unarguably, as we are about to find out, there are strong similarities between the Iliad and the Mahabharat, but everyone wants to know why. What I'm going to do is present the case of the similarities to you, and then we can discuss it and you can come to your own conclusions about why you think the two poems are so similar. So first, some background to the Iliad. The Iliad dates to the 8th century BC, it tells the story of the Trojan War, which supposedly happened in 1200 BC. So Homer was telling of events that transpired 400 years prior. But the text wasn't written down until classical times, notably Pericles, who was a general who ruled Athens, commissioned a copy of the Iliad to be written down, written down. And to give a comparison of what this would be like, this is the same as if we were to today discover a new Shakespeare play that Shakespeare had written about medieval times and write it down for the first time and decide where to divide the acts. So there's kind of a 300, 400 year gap between each of those stages. And that's the same between the events of the Iliad, when it was composed and when it was written down. Each of the Homeric epics, so the Iliad and the Odyssey, are both 24 books each. And that is also the same as the number of letters in the Greek alphabet, which is all a bit too neat for me. And that's because it's completely artificial. The divisions to the epics that we have today were decided by Scholias at the Library of Alexandria in Hellenistic times. So the text as we now have it is a later construct by other scholars and authors, as it would be if we were to today redivide a Shakespeare play that we know nothing about. They are ascribed to Homer, but they most likely formed over time by a number of different poets because they were composed through the oral tradition. And the Iliad and the Odyssey are also written in a made up kind of Greek, which was completely different to the Greek of classical times and that Homer's audiences would have been speaking. And it's also different to the Greek that it was written down in. So that is also the difference between kind of Chaucer's English to our English now. So now some background to the Mahabharat, which probably a lot of people know already. It was composed between the 3rd century BC and 3rd century AD, so that's a period of about six or 700 years. But the oldest parts are no older than 400 BC, which is 400 years later than the Homeric epics. The original events are the Kurukshetra War, which date to the 8th or 9th century BCE, which is around the time that the Iliad was being composed. But some people claim that the war took place as long ago as 3102 BC, which is a long time before the 8th or 9th century. So there's a big discrepancy there. Um, interestingly, 
Now that India is no longer under the rule of a foreign power, either the Mughals or the British, a lot more effort has been put into excavations to try and determine how historical this war actually was. And there is increasing evidence to support that it actually took place. So if you're interested in that, please watch this space. It's divided into 18 books. It has 100 sub horrors and it's 1.8 million words long, which makes it 10 times the length of the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. So this is in fact the longest poem known in literary world history ever. And it's ascribed to the us, but it was also composed orally in the same way as the Iliad and the Odyssey were. So now I'm going to give a quick plot summary of both of the epics and hopefully you can try and pick out some of the similarities. These are also both on the handout. Uh, the first one is from Wikipedia. The second one I wrote. So plot summary of the Mahabharata. It's about an ancestral struggle between the Kauravas and the Pandavas, who represent good and evil, respectively. It's based around the Battle of Kurukshetra, which only lasts 18 days, but makes up more than a quarter of the poem. Book one tells us the family background of the ancestral struggle in the two families. It introduces the princes, and it also contains the episode of the contest for Draupadi, whereby her suitors, who want to marry her, have to string a bow to win her as a wife. Arjun, who is a Pandava prince, wins, and then he takes her home. Then as, when, as he gets home, before his mother sees what his prize is, she tells him to split it between his brothers. So Draupadi ends up with five husbands, who are all brothers. Book two contains the construction of the palace and the city of Andhraprastha, and it also contains the dice game, which is a pivotal moment in the poem. This is where the Pandava brothers gradually gamble away everything that they own, including their common wife, Draupadi. And she then becomes a slave to Duryodhan, who is the eldest of the Kauravas. He then drags her around the court and tries to unrobe her, but he is prevented by the god Krishna, who makes her robe endless, so he can never fully unrobe her. Finally, the Pandavas lose the game and they're sent into exile for 12 years, and books three and four cover their exile. Then from books five to 16, we get the battle, which also features an army from Gandhara. So they're still a big cultural region at play at this time. Book six also includes the Bhagavad Gita section where Krishna has a long dialogue with Bhishma and convinces him to fight because he doesn't want to fight his cousins by reminding him of his warrior origins. Book 11 contains a lament by the women on both sides of the war for their dead. And then finally, the poem concludes with books 17 and 18 and the destruction of the Pandavas. And then it ends with the death of Krishna, the end of his dynasty and the ascent of the Pandava brothers to heaven. Okay, so now the plot summary of our next epic. The Iliad takes place in the 10th and final year of the Trojan War, but it doesn't cover the famous episode of the Trojan horse that comes from other epics and fragments. The span of the poem is only 51 days, and only nine days of that are fully narrated. But at the same time, it simultaneously covers the whole period of the war and the events that caused the war. So pre-Iliad, Paris, who was a prince of Troy, stole Helen from Sparta and took her to Troy, which is why she can be known as both Helen of Troy and Helen of Sparta. And then Helen's husband, Menelaus, and his brother Agamemnon raise an army of Greeks to fight Troy and get her back, including the famous hero Achilles and Odysseus. The Iliad then begins with a contest over Briseis. Briseis is a woman who is the concubine to the hero Achilles, but in the first book, Agamemnon steals her. Note here that there is a mirroring between the overarching woman-stealing frame of the Trojan War and the frame of the Iliad, and also an irony the Agamemnon, who is fighting a war to get a woman back, has just stolen one. So after Achilles' woman is stolen, he goes to the beach and he cries to his mother. And then he sulks and refuses to fight for 16 books. So he's a bit of a wimp at this point. No offence to other classicists who might like Achilles. Meanwhile, the Trojans absolutely dominate on the battlefield, led by their prince Hector, until Hector kills Patroclus, who is Achilles' companion and lover. Most people agree he is a lover, but you will also find a lot of people calling him just a friend or a companion. And the reason why Hector kills Patroclus is because Patroclus goes into battle wearing Achilles' armour, so Hector thinks that he's killing Achilles. 
and the death of Patroclus is what motivates Achilles to return to the battle to avenge him, hence he is probably a lover. And without Achilles, the Greeks cannot win. So this is a crucial moment. And this is also an important moment because there is a prophecy about Achilles. He is either destined to live a long life in obscurity or to live a short life but with glory. So he knows that if he fights at Troy, he is going to die at Troy. So by making this decision, he seals his fate. Then Achilles and Hector duel, and there's this moment during their duel where Hector realized that he has been betrayed by the gods and that he is about to die. And then he is killed by Achilles. Achilles then drives Hector's body around the city walls of Troy several times with his chariot. And then he takes him to the Greek camp and leaves him outside to rot. And this is a big moral violation on the part of Achilles because in the world of the Iliad, during war, you return bodies to their sides and then you give them a few days to administer the funeral rites. So Achilles violates all of that. Finally, after 12 days of Hector's body lying outside on the beach, Hector's father, King Priam, sneaks into the Greek camp and begs Achilles on his knees to give him his son's body back. And this is a moment of great pathos with which the Iliad winds to a close because Priam is reminded of his son, and Achilles is reminded of his elderly father, who is also about to lose a son. And because of that, he is moved to return Hector's body to the old man. And then the poem ends with the funeral of Hector and the line, and so those were the funeral rites of horse-taming Hector. And I pause to give a moment of silence to Hector because I absolutely love him, and I'm sure most classicists do too. So now, you could have probably picked up from those plot summaries that there are quite a lot of similarities. And we're going to discuss them now. These are on the left depictions of the Battle of Kurukshetra from a copy of the Mahabharat with illustrations. And on the right, that is an ancient Greek pot that depicts Hector being dragged around Troy by Achilles. You can see his body in black just trailing. So first, on a stylistic level, as epic poems, both of them use very elevated and stylized language. They use a lot of epithets for their heroes, similes, and lengthy descriptions. Secondly, although they both have the frame of a war and they only cover a few days of that war, both of them cover a larger span of time and include many more stories. The opening of the Mahabharata even says, what is found here may be found elsewhere. What is not found here will not be found elsewhere which is a claim to be all-encompassing of the story. But whereas the Mahabharata supposedly has a good side and an evil side represented by the two families, the Iliad doesn't, and it's much more morally ambiguous and complex, as you may, as you may have clocked from that summary in my own love of Hector. Because even though our sympathies are often with the Trojans, and they seem to have some of the nicest heroes, in the end it is the Greeks who win the war. Another big difference is the role of the gods and divine, in, sorry, another big similarity is the role of the gods and in divine intervention in the two poems. On the left, this is a recreation and a reconstruction of one of the pediment structures of the Parthenon in Greece, and that's what goes in the triangle on the top of a temple, and it depicts the gods, and this is found in the Acropolis Museum in Athens, which is opposite the Parthenon, and on the right, Ganesh and Vyas, the poet of the Mahabharata. So in both poems, the gods intervene a lot on the battlefield. They have councils amongst themselves and they meddle a lot. They also mingle among mortals, as we know from the long dialogue between Krishna and Vishva. There are also, and this is where it starts to get interesting because things get spookily similar, there are some strong parallels between our famous heroes, Achilles and Vishva. Both of them are natural warriors, but reluctant heroes who have to be convinced to fight and rejoin the battle, as we heard from those summaries. They're also both semi-divine. Their mothers are both river or sea goddesses. And for both of them, there is a prophecy about their deaths. But we're going to move from the heroes to the unsung heroes. And what interests me most, but is least discussed, and I wonder why. The strongest overlaps are between the female characters in both of the poems. So we'll start with, well, actually, the, it's Draupadi and lots of women in the Iliad. So we're going to start with her similarities to Helen, 
both Draupadi and Helen have multiple husbands. This image here on the left is Draupadi and her five husbands, who are all brothers. And on the right is Helen and Paris. You can identify Paris in art because he has a little smurf hat all the time. Um, and Helen has three husbands. She has Menelaus, her husband in Sparta, Paris, her husband in Troy. And when Paris dies, she's married to his brother, Deiphobus. So they also are both married to multiple brothers. Similar to Briseis, Draupadi also becomes a matter of contest and she is stolen from one man to, by one man from another. And those are both pivotal moments in the saga. Now let's also here acknowledge that there is another Sanskrit epic with a frame of women stealing, which is the Ramayan. Sita is stolen and so Ram wages war and overthrows a city to get her back, which if you change the names could also be a plot summary of the Iliad and the Trojan War. Finally, a very uncanny similarity. I mentioned in the plot summary that for Draupadi, her suitors contend by stringing a bow, and it's known as the contest of the bow. And this scene is exactly mirrored in the other Homeric epic, the Odyssey, in book, in a later book, with Penelope and her suitors. So Penelope is the wife of the hero Odysseus, and he takes ages to get home. So lots of people think that he's dead. And while he's gone, a whole bunch of men flock to his house to try and win over Penelope and get her to marry them. And the climax of this is that there is also a contest of the bow, where Penelope's suitors have to string a bow and the one who can do it gets to marry her. Now, those are basically identical episodes and scenarios. And there are over 40 parallels between them, if you look at the text in detail, that suggest that they both stem from a common Indo-European tradition. So what we're guessing here is that we might be starting to look at a third story that influenced both of these instead of one influencing the other. But now, instead of looking at plot or character similarities, I want to look at thematic similarities, which also have cultural and theological significance. The first of which is poets and poetry. In the Mahabharat, Vyas is both a poet and a character in the text, whereas the poet of the Iliad is an omniscient narrator who tells us the story. Vyas, whilst he is a poet, is actually not the one telling the story in the Mahabharat. And if you look at passage one on the handouts, where the handout is becoming important again, you can see how the story begins to be told in the poem. So what actually happens is that someone called Sulti approaches the Rishis and asks them if he wants them to tell them a story which he heard Vasampian tell. So there are three levels of narration here. We have our poet, and then we have the person telling the story, and then we actually have the person that he heard tell the story in the first place. So it's quite a complex um, triple narrative stru structure going on here. And that is how it leads into the dialogue that we see here in passage one. And I also want to briefly draw attention to the last few lines of passage one, because they recall the description of epic and definition that we looked at earlier, where he says, shall I recount the sacred stories collected in the Puranas containing precepts of religious duty and of worldly profit, or the acts of illustrious saints and sovereigns of mankind, which recalls exactly how epic was defined earlier. Now, moving slightly from um, the Mahabharat, in the Homeric epics, the poet is the one telling the story, but the poet relies on the muse, who is a goddess, to inspire him and give him the details of the story. And that is presented in the opening of both the Iliad and the Odyssey, where they invoke the goddess or the muse to inspire them. And sticking with the Odyssey for a second, a very similar scene to the opening of the Mahabharata is found in Book 8 of the Odyssey, which is Passage 4 on the handout. And here, Demodocus, who is a bard, so he's someone who tells stories, is asked to tell stories and delivers them in a similar way to Sulti in the opening of the Mahabharata. And you can see that we get a double narration again, because we first have the poet telling us about this episode, and then the poet telling us that Demodocus began to tell a story where it says, so he spoke and the minstrel moved by the god began and let his stories be heard. And again, it says moved by the god. So we have that idea of the gods inspiring poets to tell these tales. 
And that brings us to the main point behind this, which is that there is an interesting parallel here between the rishis in Hindu culture and bards or rhapsodes, as they were known, in Greek culture. So in Hindu culture, the rishis occupy a religious role. They are sages with religious wisdom, but they are also poets because they compose songs, they compose hymns. And similarly, the bards in Greek culture were thought to compose hymns and they were seen as religious figures because they spoke the word of God. It was the gods that inspired them to tell their stories. So both of those roles are very similar and they also occupy similar roles in the epics and the beginning of storytelling that both of the epics need. So from that, we can see that there is clearly a strong relationship between religion, poetry, and the people who tell us about poetry in the traditions from which both of these epics emerge. And this leads us nicely on to the next point, which is about the poems and religion. The images here are of one of the oldest Hindu temples found in Madhya Pradesh, and then beneath that, one of the best preserved Greek temples in the world, which in fact is not in Greece, but is found in Sicily in the Valley of the Temple. So in both of these texts, the gods are anthropomorphic and characterized, so they're kind of we imagine them as actual human figures who have distinct personalities and characteristics. And that's quite unique for religious texts. Most religious texts don't have that, especially if we think about Judaism and Islam, the God in those texts doesn't manifest themselves in the same way. It's more difficult to pinpoint the role of the Homeric epics in Greek religion. And it's not as obvious as how we know that the Mahabharata clearly relates to Hinduism. The Greeks didn't have holy texts as such. They didn't have gospels or the equivalent of Bibles or Gitas, but the Homeric poems were their closest things to that. But this is where it gets a bit complicated, and I'm happy to clarify this later. The gods, as they're presented in the poems, are not necessarily the same ones as the ones that ancient Greeks would have idolized with statues and temples or prayed to in their personal relationships with the gods. They were very aware that whilst it was the same gods, they were manifesting themselves in different ways in poems and in their real life. However, the pantheon of Olympian gods that we know today, so Zeus, Hera, Athena, Artemis, Apollo, all of them come from the Homeric poems. I think it's also important to remember here that the Mahabharata is an epic whose religion is still alive and still being practiced, whereas the Homeric epics are not. I mean, I am devoted to them. That is a completely different kind of devotion to religious devotion. Um, so it's really not the same thing. But I think that that informs a lot how we interpret them. It's easier to talk about ancient Greek epics as literature because we have no religious affinity towards them in the same way that people do for the Mahabharata. And it's the only epic poem that is still used in a religious context today that I can think of. And the Ramayana, so the Sanskrit epics are the only ones that are used today. Um, they are also very different, I think we should consider from other holy scriptures, because the Bible and the Quran and the Old Testament, the Torah, are not poetic and literary in the same ways. The Mahabharata and the Iliad are very stylized. They are very literary. A lot of effort is put into making them great works of literature as well as religious texts. And that is very important to bear in mind. Part of me wonders whether this manifestation of religion and literature, and especially this manifestation of the gods is characterized and anthropomorphic in the poems and the role that they play is because these are both polytheistic religions in the ways that the Abrahamic faiths are not. So already the structure of the religions and the form of worship and the way that ancient Greeks and Hindus envision the gods is such that it lends itself to the gods being characters in literature in a different way. And now we're on to the final similarity. And this I think is the most interesting because as you as we will soon find out it is uncannily similar between the two. And this is the idea of the gods wanting to unburden the earth through war in both poems. In 
the world of the Homeric epics, the world gets too heavy with humans and their morality drops and it weighs on the god Atlas's shoulders. In ancient Greek religion, Atlas was an actual god who literally carried the world on his shoulders. And because of this, Zeus schemes to start a monumental war to unburden the earth by killing off men, the Trojan War. And the end of the Trojan War marks the end of the heroic age during which humanity was virtuous and the gods mingled on earth with humans. So if you look at passage five on the handout, it's not from a Homeric epic, it's from an epic written at the same time by someone else that we only have fragments from now called the Cypria. But it tells us about this plan of Zeus, if you want to read that quickly. And that gives the background to the Iliad. So the Cypria kind of starts pre-Iliad. And then if you also look at passage two, towards the end, where it says the will of Zeus was brought to fulfillment, this is at the beginning of the Iliad, that those lines are often taken to reference this plan of Zeus, that through the war that the poet of the Iliad is about to tell us, the plan of Zeus to unburden the earth was fulfilled. That's the common interpretation. And the driving force of the war in the Mahabharat is much the same. And this is in passages six and seven. The earth is overburdened, so it goes to Brahma to lighten its load. And he tells the gods to descend to earth to see to the destruction of their enemies. And similar to the end of the heroic age in the Homeric world, the end of the Kurukshetra war also sees in a new age. It marks the beginning of the Kali Yuga, which literally means dark age which is the fourth and final age of humankind during which values and noble ideas have crumbled. So similarly, heroism is gone. So from those summaries, we can already see that the two are very similar. But where it gets very interesting is in the minute details of the similarities in the language between passages five and six and seven. So in passage five, we have language of oppression with the word oppressed, but then in passage six, we have tyrannized, which is almost synonymous. And that is in reference to the earth being overburdened. And then in passage five, we have a reference to Zeus. We have a reference to Brahma in passage six. In passage five, we have the language of relieve and empty of unburdening the earth. And in passage six, we have throw off. And we also have the word burden to talk about the earth being burdened. So they are very similar. But what's strange is that whereas I said that for the context of the bow, there is enough evidence to trace them back to a common tradition. In this case, there isn't. There is not enough evidence yet to suggest that these two ideas of unburdening the earth through war came from a common Indo-European theme. So then that raises the question, why are they so similar? Here, I think we should think about how other religions talk about unburdening the earth or cleansing the earth especially the Abrahamic religions and a story that we all know, the story of the great flood and Noah and the ark. A similar morality and a similar plan of God to cleanse the earth of humanity occurs in those stories. And surely it cannot be a coincidence that all these different religions from different parts of the world carry the same story. Which makes me wonder, could it be possible that at some point in human prehistory, there was a natural disaster, a great flood or a man-made disaster like a great war. And that that story traveled through all these different regions and these different religions to become the stories that we have today. I mean, all these religions actually didn't originate that far away. They all came from kind of the Mediterranean, the Arab world and India, which is not that distant and as we know from our geography and history they were all very connected so I think it's very possible that the same story is being retold in very similar ways across all of these religions so let's just wrap up and then we can start the discussion so it seems that chronology and the patterns between the poems the two poems do suggest that themes from the Iliad were adopted into the Mahabharata like a lot of scholars think. But I'm not fully content with that age-old argument. I think there is more research and inquiry that could be done to look for a broader Indo-European tradition. And I also don't want to accept that argument because it's so embedded with imperialism 
and a belief that the Western classics are superior to the Eastern classics. So we don't fully yet know why these two poems are so similar. And that question is still wide open. And I, for one, will continue to investigate it. But the message that I wanted to convey today is that we cannot deny the two-way cultural exchange at play. And we shouldn't treat these texts as two separate texts from separate traditions. If they're going to be taught, they, to, they should be taught side by side and in reference to each other. Particularly for classicists, this means we should not treat the Homeric epics as the best of all time and as unique, or should we regard them as the pinnacle of all literature when there are clearly other epics from different traditions that are so similar. I just want to end with this. This is a relief from Gandhara, which appears to depict the Trojan horse episode and the capture of Cassandra, who was a princess of Troy. You can see that it's got a horse on wheels, which must mean that the horse is not alive, but made out of some material. But I want you to look closely at the figure on the left. She has the pose akin to another relief in the British Museum. And from this, I want you to take that the Brits are looters. They have reliefs from all over the world. But look at this one now. This relief is from the Temple of Versailles in Greece. And it also depicts the siege of Troy and the capture of Cassandra. And this figure here on the right is Cassandra. Now, if we look back at the one on the left, her pose is almost identical, that kind of prostrate helplessness and yet she has the indian clothing and body shape and jewelry of the lakshmi figures that we were looking at earlier so what is going on with these reliefs the british museum doesn't really do the gandhara relief much justice it featured it in an exhibition about troy over christmas but just used it to show that the stories of troy traveled all the way to india so they missed the opportunity to do something really interesting with it and to say something which I'm going to say now, which is that this relief perfectly captures cultural exchange and how it works and how these two ancient cultures were involved in such a close relationship with each other. Here, it's like our goddess Lakshmi from the Hindu tradition has been superimposed and cut and pasted almost into the stories from ancient Greek religion. And that's very significant, the fact that those two cultures and those two mythologies blended so strongly. And what the British Museum should have done, and what I want you to take away from this, is how two cultures can come together to make something very unique. And with that, I'm going to stop talking. Thank you for listening. And I'm happy to answer any questions and have a discussion now. Hey, thank you very much, Lila. That was really interesting. Um, if you guys want to ask questions, uh, you can just put it in the chat um, and I can I can read them out. Or you can put your hand up like Sandra. Sandra, do you want to unmute yourself and say it then? Oh, goodness. I was clapping. Oh, you were clapping. OK, never mind. Thanks, Sandra. guys know about any other similarities between Indian cultures and other cultures, that would also be something cool to discuss. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. First, I wanted to say um, thanks a lot, so I really, really like that. Like, I thought it was um, fascinating, really represented um, a really fun topic, and I actually have um, a list of 11, <laughs> 11 different topics I want to ask you about. I think that's probably too much to get through now, and I don't want to hug the side there. Um, but the first thing I wanted to think is to ask is maybe just the basic thing, which is um, since I don't know, I don't know any Sanskrit, I think, and um, I wanted to know what how what the status of, sort of English translations of these um, of the Sanskrit epics are, or what the best are, or um, how they can how I can access them. Um, other people might know more about this because I don't actually read Sanskrit either. So is there anyone here who does know about how well Sanskrit is translated into English? If so... You know, what are the translations that are out there? Are they modern translations? There, there is a Penguin translation. Hmm. 
Penguin Classics does translations of the Sanskrit epics. And there was actually, there is an academic who's now an emeritus professor at Cambridge, whose life work was dedicated to translating the Sanskrit epics and looking at the relationship between, um, the linguistic relationship between Sanskrit and ancient Greek and Latin. So if you do want to read it in English, I recommend this one. Um, there are a few questions on the chat. Okay, so someone asked, what are your opinions on defacing statues in the modern context? Ooh, I thought someone would ask me about that because I just talked about being angry that some statues were destroyed. Um, so I am all for pulling down the statues of racists and imperialists that currently stand in different parts of the UK and America. Um, and um, for anyone who might think that is hypocritical because I just lamented the loss of some statues um, that were destroyed by the Taliban. I'm going to explain why I think the two are not unrelated. So I think the statues that people want to pull down in the UK, um, I think they deserve to come down because statues in society are often honorific. We put them up to represent values or morals that we as a society claim to hold. And the statues of slave owners don't go with that at all. Um, I think there are very rarely absolute rights and absolute wrongs in history and society, but the enslavement of people must definitely be one of them. And those are not values that as a society we should want to hold up. But I think that the fact, but I think besides pulling down the statues, what we have to worry about more is why there are people out there that think it's okay to keep them up. And we need to do something to tackle that because if it were, if we found out that there was a sculpture of someone who was a Nazi sympathizer or a Holocaust denier up somewhere in the UK, we wouldn't wait a minute before bringing it down. So the fact that we're hesitating over pulling down imperialists and slave owners says something about what we think about the experience of the people that want to pull those statues down and how we value or appreciate their suffering. So I do think that those statues should come down. The reason why I'm sad about the Buddhas in the Middle East being destroyed is that they weren't honorific in the same way. They were more in our modern day regarded as works of art and they were also religious monuments. And I think that across the world, we have to respect each other's religious monuments. Whether or not we agree with those religions and would want to do that ourselves is different. But what went wrong, what goes wrong in the Middle East is that because people don't respect each other's religious monuments, they have no issue with destroying them. And on a level of the Buddhas as cultural heritage or art, why the Taliban destroyed them, they'll say it was because it violated their religion, but it's actually because they just wanted to make a statement on the world stage by destroying something of world heritage. And I also want to say here, the issue is not about Muslim versus non-Muslim in the Middle East. The Taliban are extremists. They don't represent the majority of Muslims in the world. No other Muslims would want to tear that down. They and ISIS are on some extremist, iconoclastic, world-destroying mission to destroy our common cultural heritage. And that has nothing to do with anyone's religion that is being practiced anywhere else in the world. Um, and if you don't believe me, I would simply refer you to the case of Palmyra, which was destroyed by ISIS. But the curator of the site was also a Muslim Syrian, and he was executed by ISIS because he refused to leave so that they could destroy the arts of work in front of him. That just shows you that this is not about modern religions versus other modern religions. My final point would be, though, that in all cases, you can resolve this sometimes by putting them in museums. So in the case of the Buddhas, um, the Metropolitan Museum offered to send people in to excavate the statues and then put them in a museum and rehabilitate them. So that, I, um, so that the Taliban could both get rid of them if they wanted to, but that they wouldn't be destroyed. And with sculptures being pulled down, I think there's also an argument to be made of, recon of recontextualizing them in a museum, because we don't want them to come down and then for people to forget why they were pulled down in the first place. Then we would just continue this cycle of ignoring our slave owning imperialist past. If we put them down and replace it with a monument that says this was pulled down because this person was a slave owner, or if we put them in a museum with a description that says this used to stand here, but it was pulled down because of these reasons, then we can deal with that.
I hope that makes sense to everyone. I rambled a bit. Okay. Uh, the next question was, do you have any other options on the abduction rape of Sita and the, abdu the abduction rape of Helen? Um, I, I don't really, I think, again, this is one of those areas where we know that they're similar, but we don't know why they're similar. Um, if you asked other scholars, they would tell you that they're similar because the Ramayana is a retelling of the Helen saga. But I think it could just be that the stories were existing at the same time and then just became more similar through cultural exchange. Mm. Excavations in the Kurukshetra War. Yes, so if you Google this, a lot of really good articles come back, come up about current research that is going on in regions of India to determine how historical the Kurukshetra War is. If anyone else has studied this or knows about it, please interrupt me. Um, but increasingly, there are excavations going on that prove that the war actually did take place in some form. Uh, differences between the way texts and sources from practice versus non-practice religions have to be studied. Is Triv still here? I feel like Triv might be a good person to weigh in on this subject. <laughs> so, hey Triv, do you have any opinion on the difference between studying texts whose religions are still practiced versus ones whose religions are not still practiced? Um, come back to me. I'm kind of in the car. I'll have a think and give you an answer in two minutes. Oh, thanks Triv. Okay. <laughs> um, what I think is that as I said, I think it is inherently different because when I'm looking at the Iliad and the Odyssey or when Tacitus are looking at it, we can look at it purely as history. Our own beliefs don't really come into it. Obviously, our own beliefs get projected onto it. So a lot of um, Christian thought has been projected into the interpretation of ancient texts because it's mostly been Christians who have driven the classics. But I think when you're, and this is where Triv probably knows more, when you're looking at theological texts that people still believe in today, there must surely be some kind of um, reluctance to say certain things about them or to talk about them in certain ways so that you don't cause offence? Um, I think that's kind of the case in terms of causing offence. It depends on who you are and what you're studying it for. Um, I think a lot of, about going back to the Christian thing, um, people studying the Bible, they often look at texts very critically, um, irrespective of who they are. Um, and I think a lot of the time it's questioned whether, like, for example, Jesus is real or not. Um, it depends what they then put that research into, I think, is where the, um, the tricky side of it is. Um, but with non-practice religions that are studied, it's, it's all those, it's religions that are, they're always going to be there in some form, whether it be, like, be tribal religions or, um, very, very ancient ones. I think there's always some form of it that's still present in religions today, so you're never going to avoid that issue. Um, you just kind of take on the chain, I guess. But yeah. Thanks, Trim. That was interesting. Um, <laughs> next question is from Tanish, fellow classicist. Since there are so many similarities between the two, and since we have also been able to reconstruct proto Indo European to an extent cultures, how likely do you think it is that there was a unified proto-Indo-European culture and epic tradition? And do you think we able we might be able to reconstruct it? I might ask this same question back to Tanish because the, he's studied the one area of classics that I have never been able to get my head around, which is linguistics. So he might be able to tell us what we think about how Indo-European languages have evolved together or separately, if he wants to, of course, not to pressure on anyone. Um, but I think it's very likely that there was a common tradition because if we think about the way that society or humanity has evolved, right? We all came from the same place in Africa originally and then we spread. So on an anthropological level, there are some common lines uniting us there. And we know that ancestrally, when we talk about Aryans, the Aryans are, are the same kind of tribe of humanity that occupied Northern India through the Middle East, through to the Mediterranean. So there might be some very old prehistoric tribal stories that filtered down into both those traditions. But Tanaj, is there anything to say about common linguistic similarity? Tanaj, 
<coughs> okay, well, if if Pan wants to, we can cut. Um, and it doesn't have a mic. Okay, so we might get an answer in the chat section if anyone's following. Um, what was the next question? How is virginity or the concept of the pure woman treated across the two cultures? E.g. the fact that women in the Mahabharata have children with the gods and remain virgin mothers. Ooh, this is an interesting question. Um, might ask fellow women on the call who might have studied literature to chime in on this. Maybe Vidya as well, because she knows ancient texts. That's my question. I didn't hear it. <laughs> Wait, is that your question? Uh, so the question was, how is virginity or the concept of the pure woman treated across the two cultures? And then referencing the fact that in the Indian epics, women have children with the gods that still remain virgin mothers, which is also the same as the Bible, actually, that exact scenario. Um, so virginity is a very interesting concept in all ancient societies that plays a big role. Um, interestingly, in terms of reception to the Mahabharata, a lot of British scholars um, blamed the treatment of women on India on the fact that Hindu society still closely followed these texts, which I think says a lot about the way that the British view India more than it does about the way that India treats its women. Um, but apart from that, I can't think of much else. So with Helen she, in the Iliad, she's a very sexualized character. She is a woman with a lot of sexuality. Um, and that's kind of, she uses it in a very manipulative way. But, and because she's been stolen from man to man, so this is a very relevant point, I think. In the Iliad, women who move from man to man through no fault of their own, but through being treated as property, are always referred to as whores, even though they're just basically, they're treated like prisoners of war. And I think that speaks to what, um, how virginity is conceived in the world of Iliad. Vidya, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, it reminds me of um, Helen always calls herself a bitch, even though it's not her fault that she's being used by um, like Aphrodite and all the men that take her. But um, I think, Virginity is more like more a uh, motif in poetry rather than epic. It's like the women themselves are the object rather than their virginity because that's just taken for granted, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and now Vicky's question Why is it that after the cleansing in the epics, the age that follows is one of moral corruption? This is a good question. I wonder if anyone has thoughts on this. Um, I was just thinking about it, and I think it's because, as we talked about, and as Vidya told us earlier, epics are set in a time of heroes, in a time where the world, where humanity was supposed to be better than us, so we look up to, or if you're an ancient Greek, or if you live in any society, you look up to your epics as being the stories of people living in a better time, or in a better world. So I think it naturally follows from that that we envision ourselves to be living in a more corrupt world and a world with less morality than the one with the poems because these people are our heroes so they have to be better than us their times must have been better than us does that make sense okay does anyone else have any questions sorry that got really long <laughs> just give me a second to read that bit <laughs> Yeah, I like what you said about how teaching in and isolation should be to one. Okay. I'm going to guess from Zay's question, but she has a lot of thoughts on this as well. Um, I, actually, I don't know much about like um, okay. it being used in Hindu nationalism, but um, just any thoughts you have generally. I think it's always bad to use literature for nationalist purposes or for purposes that are going to divide people. Um, I think 
throughout time, we think of, if we think about any nationalist, fascist, dictator who's ever existed, they all use literature that means a lot to people to form their ideologies. So in ancient times, that was the ruler Augustus. He, another ancient epic, the Aeneid, he basically like used the Aeneid to construct his whole family history and his regime. And then people like Mussolini also reused ancient Roman stories for his own gain. Franco did the same thing with um, a lot of Spanish literature and also subdued a lot of Spanish literature. And again, the British did it with the Aeneid and basically every Euro European leader has used classical literature in some way to enforce an imperialist ideology. Um, and also in the East, this happens a lot. Like even in China, people did it. In India, as you said, people are doing it. And I think using literature for those kinds of purposes is very dangerous, but it's also so hard to escape from because when people worship texts or idolize them so much, anything you say is going to either offend them or ignite them in some kind of strong feeling. Um, so I don't. I think it's bad, and I think it's great that Indian scholars are re-embracing the Mahabharata and kind of challenging the idea perpetuated by Western classicists. But I think it verges on going too far and doing the same thing that we've done with the classics for so long, but with the um, Indian text. And does that make sense? What do you think? Um, yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Um, I was just wondering whether you had any more specific knowledge, but like I don't either, so yeah. <laughs> Um, we will look into that, we'll get back to each other. And how optimistic are you about teaching the ancient epics within a framework of cultural exchange rather than west to east diffusion? I am optimistic. I think it's going to take another generation of classicists. Um, I think it's going to take for a generation that includes people that look like me and look like Vidya and look like Tanish to have important roles in faculties across the country. Um, also, one of my good friends is also a classicist of colour and she wants to be an academic so I'm betting on her to be the first non-white professor at Cambridge but I think it's I, I'm optimistic that it will happen and the tide is turning as we can see every day in the news I'd, um, certain ideologies are going out the window and that's going to make room for different interpretations and new ideologies to come in so I think it will happen I think it's taking too long and it has taken too long but with everything, it takes people who look a certain way or speak a certain way to make real change. And when everyone looks the same and thinks the same, change doesn't happen. So it is going to take another generation or half a generation. But I do strongly believe that we can reframe the narrative about relations between the East and West. And that is a good point to end on. Thank you, Zane. Back to you, Rohan. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Okay, thank you very much for that insightful talk, Lila. Uh, I think it was really interesting to see how the cultural dispersion between ancient Greece and India has led to art and literature influencing each other, uh, particularly the two epics. Um, I'm sure if you guys have any more questions, Lila would be happy to discuss them at great length um, on Messenger. So uh, if you do want to message her, I'm, I'm sure she'd be happy to do that. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, if you do want to have, if you do want to come to any more uh, Hindu stock events, we have Bollywood Zumba tomorrow. So uh, if you'd like to join, then that'll be hosted by Gayatri. Um, and we also have some bhajans on Wednesday from Armin, which more info will be coming on Facebook, um, but do come to that as well. Um, and finally, if you haven't seen our music competition, uh, we are running a music competition. So um, there will be links to that on Facebook um, and you can send your clips into our Instagram page. Um, but thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, and stay safe and hopefully we'll see you guys soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Lila. My so much. Thanks.